I'm going to be telling you the story about a very special lady who goes by the name of Buttercup. Buttercup. The book is at the back. And this, this is her story. I was born in 1985 in Guguletu. My mom and dad were not married. I stayed with my mom and my granny, and both of them drank a lot of alcohol. When I was nine years old, my mom told me she was going away. She walked out the door without giving me a hug, without giving me a kiss, and without looking back. I stayed with my granny and others in the house, but I felt lost and I felt alone. Three years later, my mom came back with a new baby, and I learned that she got married, she had a new family, and she didn't want me with her. At school, I didn't do well. My home life was too chaotic. I was often hungry, I couldn't concentrate. I left school in grade eight. Some of the local gangsters started bothering me. I became the girlfriend of one of them. I became pregnant when I was 16. I had the baby, but I left him with his father's family when I left my boyfriend because they could feed him and they could take care of him, and I couldn't. Then I fell in love with another guy, and I had his baby. To start with, he treated me well, but then he started to beat me. At that time, my granny died, and I moved back into her house. Life was hard, and to cope with the pain, I also started to use alcohol and eventually took. I lost the house, and I couldn't look after my son. He was taken into care. I started to sell my body to get money for the tick that I needed to use more and more. I didn't like doing it, but I felt I had no choice. Then there were several guys who at first treated me well, but then they beat me up and eventually they became my pimps. I felt numb inside. I tried to separate my mind from what my body was doing. I was hurting so much. Then I met Nick. Nick seemed different. I became his girl. His brother had invited him to come from Nigeria to play professional soccer. But when he got to Cape Town, he found it was a lie. And his brother's real job was selling drugs and prostitutes. And he forced, um, he forced Nick into the same lifestyle, and then I had to work for him. Nick wasn't very happy with his way of life. And one day he told some people from the church that had been speaking to him. Um, they wanted to help him to leave the business. There were other people from local anti-trafficking organizations, Stop was one of them, who helped Nick um, to get out of the of the of the um, uh, sorry to get out of the the life that he was living, and they wanted to help me to do the same. I went to a safe house, but I realized now that I what I had there were terrible withdrawal symptoms. I couldn't cope, so I went back on the streets. The people who had reached out to me before offered for me to go to drug rehab, but I messed that up, and I ended up losing. Most of what I possessed. I lost my, all my clothes and I lost my ID document. Nick wanted me to get out of the business. I told him I wanted to, but I didn't know if I could trust the church people because I'd been abused too many times and also I felt ashamed. Sometime after this, I'd been feeling sick for a while and I had a heart attack. I ended up in the hospital. I felt so scared and alone. When I came out, I went to stay back with Nick for another two weeks. Then I was back on the streets again. I was still sad about losing my clothes because somehow my identity was tied into them. And on the streets, I started to pray. One day, something led me from the direction I was going to turn the other direction. I turned a corner, and there were two black bags there. When I opened them up, there were clothes. One had clothes in, the other had shoes in. They were all my size. I felt that God had heard my prayers. Another time, one of my old clients, an elderly Jewish gentleman, said he wanted to buy me something and asked what I wanted. He took me to a shop, and I could choose a cell phone. I felt that God could see me, and he wanted to bless me. I knew about God because I'd, I'd, I knew about him before I came into this life. But I suddenly started to think about him more. But I was still on the streets and doing drugs, and I held myself back from him. One day, a dealer I went to for drugs wanted to force himself on me for sex. 
I had just had enough of being used and abused by people. And I said, no, this downtrodden woman with no self-confidence and no self-worth said no, and it felt good. I spoke to God then, and I said, I will give you whatever it takes if you would change my life. I don't want to die like this. I'm tired of living this kind of life. Please, will you get me out? Suddenly, I started feeling dizzy. My head was spinning. I sat down on the pavement. A police van came by. Normally, they would have chased me away, but a policewoman put me in the van and took me to hospital. I was told I'd had a stroke. I was scared. I couldn't write. I couldn't talk. I couldn't hold a pen. I couldn't also think clearly. Eventually, I was discharged from hospital, and I managed to get hold of Nick, who picked me up again. I told him I needed help and was completely finished with drugs. He called two of the ladies who had been helping him. They came and prayed with me, and perhaps it was that prayer that finally set me free. Since that day, I haven't smoked or taken tick. They got me into a safe house, but I felt out of place. I still couldn't talk properly, and I felt the other residents there were laughing at me. We went on an outing, and I ran away, and I went back to the place I used to live with Nick. Everybody there was so pleased to see me, but I felt out of place. I felt like I didn't belong there anymore. And I managed to get back to the safe house with the help of the police, and I was taken back in. I asked the other residents for forgiveness, and that is when I started to feel accepted. We went through a healing and restoration program. We had counseling each week with a social worker. And I eventually did a job readiness course and a computer course. I saw all these things as signs of God's love for me. I started to love Jesus, and I wanted to know him more and more. As I sought God, my negative thoughts began disappearing. I began to realize that I had opened many wrong doors while looking for love. But now I had found true love, the love of God. I gave my life to him and was baptized on the beach. I came out of the water feeling a huge relief, like a burden came off my shoulders. Back at the that safe house, I still had to have physiotherapy and speech therapy. One day I told the lady who was treating me that I wanted to write a book so that I could tell other people what God had done for me. She said she would help me. It was very hard telling her about the things that had happened to me, and I cried a lot, but I felt God healing me. One of the first words she had me say was buttercup, because I had to use my tongue in many different parts of my mouth. Buttercups are wild flowers. They're nothing fancy, but they're radiant in their beauty. I, too, am an ordinary, broken woman. Yet God's love made me into a beautiful flower, and that's why I chose the name Buttercup. Part of my restoration process was to connect with my family again. I met my father and my sons, and forgiveness has taken place. I also went back to speak to some of the other treasures I used to work with on the streets. After a year in the safe house, I did a, a discipleship training school with Youth with a Mission where I learned my identity in Christ. During the three-month outreach, God used my testimony powerfully. Jesus has brought me from darkness to light. I finally have a sense of purpose. My journey has truly begun. I'm um, just, again, this is the, the, where you can read the full story of that um, testimony that I just read out, Buttercup. Judaism marketing was... <laughs> Okay. I'm 27 years old. I come from a good home. I needed a job because I have a little boy of six years old. He needs new clothes, and I want to send him to a good school. I went on Gumtree to go look for a job. I didn't have any qualifications except matric. I see advertisements for businesses looking for receptionists. The one pays 8,000 rand for a full day job plus benefits, and the other pays 16,000 rand for a full day job plus benefits. I apply for the 16,000 rand job. I send them my CV and a photo of myself. The next day, they phone me to go in for an interview. I get there and they tell me the receptionist post has been filled, but they can hire me as a masseuse. 
I have no experience as a masseuse, but they assure me that they will provide all the training and they will pay at me 5,000 rand more. I say yes, and the next day I start as a masseuse. My first morning, everyone welcomes me, and I love it. Later that day, one of the, girl offers, one of the girls offer me a pill and say I'm going to need it when I see my first client. It's to prevent the pain. I see my first client and request more services that's on offer. I, ref I refuse, and the madam smacks me and th through the face and threatens to have my son killed if I don't do what is asked. I go in and, have to and he performs anal sex on me and it hurts like hell. Every time my client wouldn't put down the toilet seat or leave their water cup out, I would get a 2,000 rand fine. By the end of the month, I was 45,000 rand in debt bondage. Every time I wanted to leave, my, fam my family would be threatened. My boss would beat me and whip me. All I could think of is how stupid I was that I didn't apply for the other job. I wanted to be free so bad. I worked for a year and was 1.8 million rand in debt. Then I met Barry. He assured me that the blood of Jesus is stronger than the threats these people made. He told me all about Jesus, and I told him all about my dreams to have a business degree. Barry paid for me to go to college. Through him, Jesus gave me back life and hope. Please give a big hand for Cora. My story is a story about two Zimbabwean girls, uh, Kim and Precious. Um, they were orphaned and they were um, living with their parents in Gweru uh, area in, in Zimbabwe. Their mom was a um, lecturer in human resource management at a university. The father was a huge businessman. And they were Christians and they loved the Lord, this family. And the dad and mom unfortunately died and in separate car accidents, the one in September and the one in December of one year. These children were um, taken to their grandmother in Karoi, that's right up at Kariba Dam. In the most rural area you can imagine, they were literate, illiterate, or they were literate, they were computer literate, they were brilliant young girls growing up in a lovely family and an educated home. Their um, family took all, their, all they owned, the cars, the, everything that was their inheritance, and sent them to their granny. So while they were with their granny, there were 11 other grandchildren up there. And uh, the granny said, your mom and dad were the, were the ones who were providing for all these 11 grandchildren. I can't look after you anymore. You must go and find a domestic worker in Harare. They were, uh, I think they were 13 and 11 at that stage. And they just said to their granny, no, we don't want to. We want an education in life. And their aunt Lydia came and she said, the mom's sister, and she said, I'll take them to Polokwane in South Africa, and I will give them an education there. The granny was very grateful. The aunt went ahead of them, and she put them on a truck, and they came to the, to the river there at uh, the Limpopo River, walked over the river, and, then, and the hippos and the crocs didn't see them. <laughs> and they were just robbed of their birth certificates because they didn't have passports. So they got onto the orange farms there. And Aunt Lydia was helping them through, helping them through, helping them through right into Polokwane. Seven o'clock the evening, they landed in Market Street, Pick and Pay, Polokwane. And the aunt didn't answer her phone when they phoned her. There they're standing, 15 and 13 years of age, with their bags and everything they own. And in a foreign country, nobody around them. And they heard music playing. And it was a church service that was going on on the, on, the, on the taxi rank. They went along and they attended the church service. And they said, thank God, it's an all-night prayer <laughs> service. So they could sit in this prayer meeting all night. Next morning, they're standing on the side of the road again, waiting. And they can't get hold of Aunt Lydia. She's not answering her phone. Aunt Bridget comes by. And um, she's Shauna speaking, and they asked her, please help us, because we, um, our aunt is not answering the phone, and we don't know where she is and what's going on. Aunt Bridget takes them home, and she takes them to child welfare. 
and child welfare phone me and say, I've got two girls that have landed here. That, are they border hoppers? Are they victims of trafficking? Please come and do an assessment. And I did an assessment that these beautiful, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed girls <laughs> are standing in front of me and I can see they haven't been trafficked. It's not sexually exploited, nothing. You know, it's like invisible. God made them completely invisible. Their parents were sons and daughters of the Most High God. And so um, they just said, please, we just want an education. So um, an, a, a Christian school called Eagle's Nest Christian School. We're bringing you wonderful stories here, aren't we, tonight? A Christian school called Eagle's Nest Christian School in Polokwani took them in, into the hostel, gave them free education. It's, um, it's, a, it's a private Christian school. Gave them free education and brought them right through. But in um, the process, by the time they, the one was in matric and the other one was standard nine, the school approached us and said, um, these children need parents, a mom and a dad. They cannot continue their complete orphans. So Precious and Kim became our most beautiful and precious daughters. And my husband is dad, and I'm mom, <laughs> and they're studying at Northwest University. The one is in her second year now doing exactly what her mom was a lecturer in, and the other one studying nursing. But this is the beauty of the grace of God upon parents who love Jesus. Even if you die, your children have a legacy. But I want to backtrack and just talk to you about the trafficking part of it. So um, Aunt Lydia goes back to Zimbabwe, and the granny asks, where are my grandchildren? And she says, no, they came through to Polokwani, but they escaped and ran away, and they are now prostitutes in Polokwani. She tells the grandmother. So do you understand what they were trafficked for and what was in her heart? So the grandmother gets a stroke and dies. The school sends these daughters up to go to the funeral, the family believe Aunt Lydia and wouldn't let release those girls to go back to school. After 10 days, an uncle comes to them from Chinoy, and he says he believes them. He contacts the school. The school sent money, and the girls, after 10 days, went back. So um, the story is actually that Aunt Lydia trafficked them for sexual exploitation to South Africa. But God, in his grace, when they were standing there, for the traffickers to go by, there was this music playing in the church, and they just went to the church service. The next morning, they were standing there again, waiting with Aunt Lydia, and Aunt Bridget goes by, a lovely daughter of God, and she um, takes them and brings them to child welfare. And this is the most amazing story. And so uh, one night, Kim comes down the stairs, and she says, Mom, I had this awful dream. I dreamt Aunt Lydia was handcuffed. And everybody was crying, but me and Precious, we were not crying. And she was uh, put into the police van, and she was, um, and everybody was crying. So I said to her, you know, this woman is busy with something. She's busy with more trafficking than just you two girls. There's something happening here. A little while ago, I asked Precious, I said, Precious, have when last you hear about Aunt Lydia? She says, ach, I heard that she's in prison for mule drug muling or something. But you know, um, and so this, so this is the story of our daughters and of human trafficking, but it's a story for me of God's grace and God's mercy and God's goodness upon the lives of sons and daughters of God and about the family of Christ. So that's actually my story. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> So I'm going to share another testimony. My name is Jess, and I am 21 years old. I was adopted when I was four years old from China and moved to New York in the United States. My adopted parents started trafficking me when I was seven years old. It started with men coming to my father's house to rape me for money. As I started to get older, my father and mother started getting more violent. They forced me to use drugs like heroin, and they sold me more frequently. I started spending my weekends, nights, and school breaks in brothels, hotels, and in my father's basement, where he would lock me in there until he needed me, sometimes for hours on end without food. For 10 years while my parents were trafficking me, they forced me to recruit girls. 
it was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. I was living two completely different lives growing up. I was going to school during the day, being an A student, and then I would come home to abuse, rape, addiction, and pain. When I was in sixth grade, I went to a school assembly where the topic was sexual abuse and what to do if you're being abused. It was that moment when I had finally realized what was happening to me, but I was too scared to tell anyone or to do anything about it. While my father was trafficking me, I got pregnant three times and had to have three abortions. I was also trafficked for a week to Istanbul, Turkey, where I didn't know the language or where I was, so there was no way for me to escape. I was left in a trap house with another female victim who was under the age of 12, and the things that happened there are too gruesome to talk about. A couple months after my trafficker brought me back to the States, I ran away from my father and started living with anyone I could find, including boyfriends, pimps, and friends. The day I ran away, I asked my mom if she loved me, and she responded by saying, I don't know, and I never thought of that before, and it broke me. That day, I went to the public library, and I did a Google search on the computer for, can God love me? That was when I came across a spoken word poem on YouTube from a girl who lived in Florida but was currently living in South Africa as a missionary. I sent her an email asking if God could love someone like me, and she said, yes, he could. Over the course of the past three years, we would email back and forth and call each other almost every day to talk about God, the Bible, and faith in Jesus. We started reading verses together and would pray together over the phone, and I felt like I could finally tell someone my story. After about three years of having a friendship with my friend, I ended up moving to the same state that she lived in. And when she came home from South Africa to visit me this past Christmas, we were able to meet in person for the first time. She would invite me to her church, and her family had me over to their house to celebrate my birthday and Christmas. It was the first time anyone ever bought gifts for me or made me a birthday cake. But during that time, I was still living in an unhealthy living situation that was mimicking my past. I was still being forced to sell my body and prostitute for money, and I was still addicted to drugs. So after spending more time at church and with my friend's family, I decided that I didn't want to live this way anymore. I wanted to stop doing drugs and stop letting people abuse me. I wanted to be free. So I asked my friend if she could get me out and help me find safety. Within a few weeks, I moved into a Christian safe home where I was able to sleep at night for the first time without someone coming into my bedroom and raping me. For the first time, I knew I was safe. I continued to go to church every Sunday with my friend and her family, and after about a few weeks of living at the safe home, I made the decision to accept Christ. About a week after that, I received communion for the first time, and I got baptized. Making this decision to leave my old life behind and follow Jesus was one of the scariest things I've ever done, <sighs> but I'm so glad I did. To this day, I still struggle with memories from my past, and I struggle with believing that it wasn't my fault. But I'm learning to receive God's forgiveness and grace and love, and I'm learning that I don't have to struggle with any of this stuff alone anymore. God says in his word that he's always with me, that he will never leave me or walk away. For me, leaving the life behind and walking away from my pimps, my addictions, and my adopted parents who were trafficking me was the hardest thing I've ever done. But because I have God by my side and my amazing friends who love me unconditionally, I was able to completely surrender to Jesus. I learned that I'm loved, I was loved, and I will always be loved by God and by the people he put in my life. There are days when the healing process hurts. And on those days, I have to fight not to go back into the life and run back to my traffickers. But I'm learning to not give up by having grace for myself and to keep my eyes focused on God and nothing else. This journey of faith and healing has not been easy, but because of Jesus and the freedom he's given me, it has definitely been worth it. I am a new creation. <laughs> um, whew, I just got to catch my breath. Oh my gosh. Um, so I, uh, I actually wrote a spoken word, a spoken word poem um, about human trafficking, and uh, Nicole said that I could share it with you guys. It's not memorized, so I'm going to read it <laughs> off of here. Um, so yeah, I hope, I hope it touches your heart. <sighs> My heart is beating so fast right now, you guys, it's not even funny. Okay. Coming face to face with the truth is hard. It requires a kind of courage, a kind of humility, especially when that truth points directly to a sick and sad reality that is being fueled by man's depravity. It's called slavery. It's a man-made and modern-day tragedy that is stripping men of their sanity and women of their dignity. This world needs to wake up from the fantasy that falsely believes this can never, ever happen to me because it's happening. 
It's happening in our own backyards, and we've been ignoring it for far too long. Ignorant comments are being thrown around like confetti, but don't just take it from me. Turn on the news. It's on every station. Girls are being raped and boys are being taken. It's time to wake up to the realization that millions of human beings are living as slaves in every single nation. This isn't a petty crime. It's a global operation, a force that's free from the limitations of both racism and discrimination. Whether you're Indian, American, African, or Asian, traffickers today don't care about your age, race, gender, or sexual orientation. They'll violate your rights no matter what the occasion. But we, the sometimes naive, take one superficial glance at a victim and call them ignorant, senseless, and foolish. We say things like, how could he fall for that? Why did she let him do it? How could that person be so stupid? We make judgments, assumptions, and shallow comments, thinking that we've grasped the full story when we haven't even perused past the table of contents. We're too busy beautifying and prioritizing our personal lives to notice the pain and the hurt and the cries that have been, that have been staring us straight in the face this entire time. It's time. It's time to wake up, world. It's time to wake up, church. Wake up, wise up, and wipe the sleep off your eyes. This crime isn't going away. It's been thriving since the beginning of time. And as they stand in the shadows, wounded and weary, we walk down the streets, abandoning the orphan, pointing fingers at the prostitute and neglecting the needy. We perpetuate society's problems instead of trying to solve them by mindlessly cutting down the proverbial branches without intentionally pulling up the roots that have actually caused them. The real problems here aren't just a lack of education and global poverty, no. The root of the real problem is found at the core of man's depravity. It's a sin sickness, a deceitful heart, a broken spirit, and an exploited vulnerability. It's the wrong idea that marriage is dead and that sex is a commodity, that there's nothing wrong with buying and selling people or watching pornography. It's the twisted thought that some people think that some lives matter more than others when it comes to the concept of equality. Listen to me. This evil is real. And this evil has a name, and this evil is alive. And until we do something about stopping the demand, the need for the supply will continue to thrive. The number of modern day slaves is on the rise, most of them fighting by the second just to find a way to survive, and the sooner we decide to mobilize and empathize instead of constantly trying to criticize and compromise, we'll be one step closer to changing the world and saving more lives. But for now, we fuel the fire by investing riches into the porn industry, dollars and cents into sweatshops, and don't even get me started on the cruelty of organ trafficking and child marriage because that just might literally make your heart stop. There will be a day when justice will rule once and for all, when victims will claim victory and the nobodies will become somebodies, when the captives are no longer held in captivity, their chains breaking totally, as they stand before the throne of the King of Kings, officially accepted and loved unconditionally, they will know that they're no longer for sale because Jesus has already paid the price for their lives on the cross at Calvary. He's conquered sin and death and shame and pain, and he's coming back again to bring his kids safely home for all eternity. But that day is not yet. It's not yet time to rejoice because there's still men, women, and children enslaved all over our world without a chance and without a voice. Our brothers and sisters are weeping in the dark, longing to be heard, but left without a choice. And they need our help. It's not too late. So let's choose to be Jesus' hands and feet starting now, starting today. We can be the change. Being bold, being brave, and breaking the silence, speaking out, staying strong, and shining a bright light into the darkness, let's come together for freedom's sake and let's stand together for what's right. Because when it comes to stopping this injustice and saving someone else's life, even one small act of faith, hope, and love can make a huge difference in this global fight. That was, I think you'll agree, that was very powerful. It's a powerful way to end. It gives us something to really ponder on. And we would like to just encourage you all to pray. If you don't know what to do next, take the first step and pray. Pray for the people that are held in captivity. What Sam was, was talking about there, it's not, it's, not a, it's not something imagined. It's something which is very real. So let's pray for each man, woman, child that is being held in captivity against their will. They're being used and abused right now. <laughs> <laughs>